Welcome to the Startup Grind. All right, well, the way, the way we like to kick things off is I'm always interested to know, and I know these folks are as well, to get a little bit of insight into your backstory. Okay. So let's start with where did you grow up? Okay. What did your parents do for work? And what did you think you wanted to be when you grew up? Okay, so uh, Carolina native from North Carolina, uh, Salisbury, right side of Charlotte. Uh, moved to the Midwest though when I was younger. Uh, Dad basically was a, went to be a preacher out in the Midwest, uh, so I'm a PK. <laughs> and uh, was homeschooled uh, since second grade. Uh, graduated high school at 15 and I couldn't get into the college that I wanted to get into. Uh, so I went to Barnes and Nobles and bought books on programming and did that in my spare time. And thankfully my parents let me uh, Spent about 15 hours a day on the computer and didn't ask me questions. <laughs> That's good. And what were they doing? Were they entrepreneurs? Uh, they? So dad was like, uh, he's like the old school businessman. He started out, uh, he grew up, he's one of like eight or nine kids. Uh, grew up on a farm in North Carolina. Okay. And dad started uh, buying old cars, paying them, selling them. Then he went to houses. And then he uh, got uh, invested in some land that got developed and all this stuff. So basically I learned like, how to make money work for you in the sense of, okay, you start small and you keep building, building, building and stuff. And yeah. because of that, he was able to basically be a, a you know, pastor, do minister. And mom was a stay-at-home mom and took care of me. This is my mom's boy, so. <laughs> That's awesome. So you're 15, you decide you're gonna learn to code because you can't go to your school of choice right now. Were you thinking about it from an entrepreneurial angle, or you no. were just interested in? I was going to go to a uh, college in Oklahoma called ORU, it's Old Roberts University, and I was going to go uh, major in music. Okay. And uh, because they wouldn't let me in, I started doing programming. By the time it got close enough for me to get in, I was like, you know what? I really enjoy this. I spend all my free time doing it. I was a moderator in an IRC chat room, you know. <laughs> uh, and so I'll, we, I actually ended up going to community college, okay. and they basically gave me a, a, a ride to go there. So I just got certification, skipped all the basics. I hated school, so yeah. <laughs> I was like, get out. And I uh, got a, my first programming job at oh, 17 or 18, and then one more after that, and that's when I started. Uh, all right, what, uh, going to Barnes & Noble. I'm gonna, I love, I love yeah. people that just uh, have the initiative and teach themselves how to code, so I'm going to focus on it for a second. Okay. What do you, what's like the language of choice? What do you, what do you so start So then with? was Visual Basic, Visual Basic 4 and 5, you know, uh, which is really cool because you could drag and drop to make yeah. the UI and then program it really easy. So I started out with that. Uh, then I started using, doing C, okay. C++, and actually wrote like a tiny little database engine. Didn't really know what I was doing. And then I wrote a shell replacement for Windows. Okay. That's what I grew up on. And then it um, wasn't until after that that I got into PHP and MySQL and all that stuff, which was kind of like the what made web development so easy and fun back in the day. Sure. Really, it was before Ruby really became popular at all. So, yeah. yeah. So, you get your first job. Did you ever go to college? I did. I went two years at a community college, uh, Tulsa Community College okay. in Oklahoma, and uh, got out as soon as I could. I, just, I, I actually just I didn't like school because school teaches you in a certain formatted way. Yeah. And um, you know, when you go home and you're used to learning things at your own pace, you feel held back by it. You know? And that's a kind of good advice, too, when you're trying to hire employees. Are you hiring someone who went to school for programming just to get a job, or are you hiring someone who actually spent 12, 15 hours a day behind the computer? Because yeah. they're passionate about it. Sure. Know, so. so that first job, were you passionate about it? What was it? Uh, yeah, I worked as a, a web developer doing like black market SEO stuff. Like we were tricking Google, <laughs> and they're like we basically spammed Google with like all these links yeah. to make it think the page was higher. And then when we sensed the user agent was from another user, we showed them the real web page. It was like a big no. -no. Yeah. And the guy was banking money. I, I got a job, sweet, you know? And then like, I think they had a disgruntled employee that got fired, he turned us into Google, and the business just tanked. Yeah. You can tell us. Did you find this job on Craigslist? No, it was actually <laughs> on like a church buddy. He worked in my youth group, and I was like, hey. I was like, dude, please hire me. Like, I, I, I would work for free. All right, so that tanks, Google gets smart. Yeah. The black hat stuff goes away. What was the, what was the next next program? Uh, went on. I quit that job and went on working for a financial firm, uh, doing more legit stuff and uh, writing basically the back end or doing credit card payments, ACH payments. Uh, if you know anything about the banking system? It's archaic. Writing ACH batch files is you got to get all the spacing right, otherwise it gets rejected. So it was it was work and it was fun, but. Yeah. Uh, it was not the ideal programming job I would like to have. So sure, how yeah. long did you last? Well, a while, uh, four years. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Were you playing with things on the side at this point? Were you? Yeah, so I was always piddling with things on the side, and uh, one of my my 
first started out wasn't really anything, it was called Indie Five. This okay. is back when iTunes, it was hard for independent musicians to get on iTunes. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, screw iTunes, I'm gonna build my own iTunes, an independent artist. Uh, spent like two years, three years working on it, launched it, did zero marketing and flopped, of course, as it should. Yeah. Um, after that, I started something called Echo Pick. This was back when Dig was huge, before Reddit became really popular. When something would get posted to Dig, it, it would get taken down, the hug of death. And so I would build Echo Pick, which is basically what Imager is today, and I would copy the image and host it and get traffic that way and make a little money on AdSense. And then, which would segue into actually what became TwitPic. So, what um, was Echo Pick? Was Echo it, Pick. Was it successful? Were you making like. It was successful money? in the sense that, like, I was actually getting people to come into my website, yeah. which is like, oh, wow, people are using my stuff, you know? And uh, I think we made enough to cover the server bill. I was, I was leasing a $40 a month server in Texas. And uh, what year is this? Well, this is 2007. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, 2006, 2007, yeah. So we're, we're hosting our own infrastructure yeah. at this point. Yeah. You got a server in Texas, you're paying 40 bucks a month. Right. Breaking even. All right, and you said that 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 segued into TwitPix. So right. you're still at your old job, right? This is just nice yeah. things type thing. So here's the thing. I grew up in rural Oklahoma, and we got dial-up until like 2010. So <laughs> I would actually stay late at my office so I could use their fast internet. Because if you ever try to upload stuff on dial-up, you're there forever, you know? trying to download stuff on Napster, that one you know, <laughs> NSYNC song, you know, that you don't want people to know you're listening to, but you download it anyways. Uh, so I would stay late, and so what happened was, I uh, it was actually my second time to join Twitter, okay. and uh, I saw a tiny URL, that was really cool, it was a, an easy way to share photos on, on Twitter. So yeah. I ripped the code out of Echo Pick, put it in a Twit Pick, and like the aha moment was, I was actually staying, working later on the weekends, didn't have much of a social life, so I just, well, on the computer, yeah. okay. and, uh, uh, I thought, well, I can hook the comments from this to go back as an at reply on Twitter, which is everything, you know, circular. And then launched it, and then the following Monday, Mashable wrote about it. And so, of course, I flipped out and thought I'd made it and was ready to retire, but, you know. So. Yeah. <laughs> let me, let me see Sorry. if I get this right. Yeah, I'm that, that's, that. a, that's like an incredible journey that seemed like it just happened overnight. So you, yeah. you built, how long did it take to move Echo Pick to Twitter? So, uh, probably uh, a weekend. The code, okay. the original version of Echo Pick I probably wrote over a week. It's okay. very, you know, the code was like, you just write it as quickly as possible to make it work. Yeah, and you see Twitter. Yeah. What are, uh, like, are there any competitive photo sharing products out there? No, time? so we were, as far as I know, the first photo sharing app on Twitter. Um, obviously, I got the name, half the term Twitter, half the term picture, TwitPick. Yeah. We'll, we'll circle back to that towards the end. And, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, uh and just thought, cool, I would want to use it, hopefully some of my friends will use it, and be, a thousand people use it, great, cool. Yeah. So. Were, you, were you thinking, like, at the time that I can scale this off the back of Twitter, or were you thinking just, like, this is interesting, I would use it, I'm just going to see what happens? Basically that. You Like, I just, I had no idea what I was doing, yeah. you know? I just, like, building things, and I thought, well, Twitter's kind of becoming hot now, and hot in the sense of early adopters, and... No way to share photos, and I came from the old Flickr background. Yeah. So, uh, which Stuart Butterfield was like my idol. I actually emailed Stuart Butterfield, he, of course, who's the founder of Slack, which is the hot uh, startup. He actually responded to me when I was like 17. That's awesome. And like, oh, I was like fan, I was fangirling hard. I was like, dude, <laughs> I love what you do with Flickr. He's like, thanks, man, I appreciate it. Or something, you know, so, yeah. It's, it's, it's the little things. <laughs> right, right. It means a lot. Um, okay, so we got Twitpick, you're still the other company. You said, Mashable cut onto it. So what what's happening on Twitter that is getting the attention of a national publication? So I guess it just started uh, People started using it and because it kind of just grew virally because you posted to it The link got to Twitter the put big link and you commented and it also got posted so it's kind of just Grew organically. We never did any marketing for it. But who are you, who are you tweeting that? I'm tweeting. No one's doing my. I'm not getting picked up on Nashville. I, I, you know, I honestly don't know how they found us. They spelled our name wrong at first. It was <laughs> Twit Space Pick, which was like the biggest like pet peeve. But yeah. whatever, I'll take it. And uh, it then it just it just snowballed from there. So this is February 2008. All right. And you were even a company at this point. I had like an LLC on the side that I just had. You know, I started the LLC just so I could have business cards. So yeah. I feel like I was legit. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's the first step. You got a logo, you got a business card, right, you're, right. you're a Done. Fan. Cash out. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, all right, so you're still at your other company. Nashville picks it up. Things are picking up. What, what, yeah. what do you see happening? So uh, basically, this is February 2008. Uh, social media then, you know, we take for granted now how mature it is. Facebook, LinkedIn, Snapchat, which I'm just now trying to get on that. Uh, 
it was such a new world then. People like sharing things about themselves, so of course social media would catch on and stuff. So it kept just growing exponentially and it kept posting on the server just fine uh, until a big tech guy got on there. Basically, every time he posted a photo, it would just take that one server down. Remember who it was? It was Kevin Rose. No shit. Kevin Rose, right. yeah. And so I had to move everything real quick that night to where the photos were hosted on S3 because that was the main bottleneck, and that, that saved us for another few months. And early on, like I thought, okay, cool, it's growing. We'll see what happens. I actually got an email, was an email from Tony Shea from Zappos. Are you still at your other company? I'm still at my other company, right. Okay. So Tony Shea, the CEO of Zappos, the shoe company that I bought these shoes from, you know. Uh, he's like, hey, uh, like what you're doing with TwitPic. Love to fly you out. I'm like, yeah, where we go? Let's go. <laughs> They're in Vegas, right outside of Vegas in uh, uh, Anderson or something. How old are you now? Just the so 2008. Uh, man, I'm dating myself. <laughs> the problem with age and internet years, it's like times four. So yeah, I was so 23 or 24. Okay, so yeah. you're still young. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not that you're old. I'm not saying <laughs> right. that. But all right, so you're going. Yeah. You got Tony. Tony hits you up. You go. Yeah. So I go out there. I get the. They put us up in the Palazzo cars, picking us up. I'm starstruck, you know. And uh, basically, they were interested at the time in purchasing TwitPig and then actually hiring me to work on their, their products team, working with Tony building new stuff. Uh, very honored to have that offered. And so I said, well, let me think about it. Went home. And I, uh, I knew that if, if they were willing to offer around the six-figure range for a product that was like four months old, this is in 2008, yeah. I was like, well, maybe this could grow into something. So I emailed them back, said thank you so much. I you know, declined, but really appreciate it. Yeah. So and then continued growing on. And so, yeah. So you're four months old, Tony hits you up. Yeah. Um, how many users or pictures a day? You, you think know, you're probably less than 10,000 a day. I would imagine that could be way off. But yeah, it was pretty low in the first year, you know, nothing to, you know, huge. Sure. And still running off that one server, so. Yeah, like, yeah. what are you doing during the day? You're like... So I work, you know, a normal nine to five, and then on my lunch breaks, I'll go work on it if I need to. If the site's down, I gotta go take a break and fix it, <laughs> work on it at night and stuff. Uh, Is that all you think about at this point? Yeah, and basically one time, I was actually going to my parents' house during the holidays, and the site went down, something broke, and I couldn't get on the internet there, so I had to go drive to the apartment complex yeah. with my laptop out and find an open Wi-Fi spot to fix it. You know, I was like driving around like a sketch ball. You know? and, and, which I found out it's actually illegal to do that, man. You know, yeah. so. so are you are you really risk adverse? Like why are you not just quitting your job at this point and going all in? So I didn't have ads on it for the first three or four months. So you're not making money. Yeah, not making money. So then I was like, man, let's throw some AdSense on there and threw AdSense on it. Of course, I started making money um, and enough to pay for the server. And uh, as the traffic grew, the AdSense grew with it kind of kept us afloat. Um, it wasn't until really 2009, so in 2009, I'm sitting at my desk, uh, the site's down. Yeah, that's weird, it doesn't really go down much anymore. I go to Twitter, there's this Twitpic link being retweeted. I uh, remember forever, you know, it's 135XA, that was the short letter okay. for it. Uh, it was the plane that crashed in the Hudson River. So the plane that crashed in the Hudson River, one of the uh, our users, Dennis Crumbs, was on the ferry that went to go pick people up off the boat. So he snapped a photo quit picked it, forgot about it, actually letting passengers use his phone to call mom and dad or family were okay. And I just see this being just blasted out. Somehow I got the site back up and that's when it kind of dawned on me. Clipic's about a year old, like this is how media or news is going to be spread. This is what Twitter's going to be, this is what Clipic's going to be. And that's when I really started realizing that I mean, I got to quit my job or I've got to give this up. And yeah. So at the time it was not generating anywhere near enough revenue to support me, but I had a little bit of savings. Okay. So, um, I just actually decided, so this is still in Oklahoma, I decided to go move to South Carolina. I saw the movie The Patriot, which was filmed here, <laughs> and, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, so, mom and dad convinced them to come out here on a family vacation, so we came out and loved it so much that I uh, uh, moved out two weeks later and been here since 2009. So. Moved out without a job, I take it. Out of job or and this job. much savings, right, yeah. Moved to Daniel Island, actually, right over here next door. So, um, and actually, on the trip out, TwitPick kept going up and down, up and down, up and down. I didn't know how to scale certain things and had to contact this company, fix some stuff in the database, and it worked great again. So still not knowing how to scale this thing, just yeah. trying the best I could. What were your parents thinking at this time? Like, very hardworking people, yeah. maybe not as familiar with the internet as you. Like, do they think you're 
I'm just I'm something do they believe in what you're doing? They just kind of shook their head. Mom's like, well, that's nice. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> like, Mom, you don't understand. Yeah. Pull so, over the car. Right. Milo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. And uh, actually, it was around that time uh, they kind of saw the pressure and the stress hitting me because I'm running the books and trying to keep the side up. Out of pity, Dad's like, listen, I'm going to help you out. Dad's an old, this old school businessman. I'll keep your books yeah. straight. I'll keep your taxes. I'll keep you out of jail. All right. <laughs> and. Uh, then mom came on shortly after that doing content moderation and customer service. And so, uh, which, fast forward that a couple of years before, I kind of realized mom was looking at pornography all day on TwitPic, deleting it <laughs> done to my poor mother. But she did a, she did a great job. And, <laughs> which actually, so I don't know if y'all, you want me to skip forward or not, but mom actually banned 50 Cent one time. I'm out at the Windjammer, and all of a sudden 50 Cent starts blasting out about F TwitPic. Like, oh crap, what'd we do, man? And like he got banned. I was like, Mom, did you ban this user? He's like, Yeah, he's not posting. No. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know who it was. So I was like, Mom, you can't ban 50 Cent, all right? So we got him back on. And another story in that vein, uh, I can't say his name, but a famous rapper and his wife, uh, she uh, liked to post photos that were not new, but were close to it and were against our terms of service. So we kind of had to, like, I think she got banned automatically or something. And then she's like, What's up? So I, Sent him a DM, gave him a number. I got a call from him <laughs> and his wife, and like we worked something out. Like, oh, you know, we love having you on the site, but we might need to just cover up a few parts, you know, yeah. just to keep your kids safe, you know. But he, like, <laughs> big time rapper calling you on the phone, right? And you're and just like, <laughs> I can say yes or no. I can say yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. Um, well, I don't even know where to go from that. That's, no. that's, that's, that's an incredible that's story. It. We're done. And that's a wrap. You banned 50 Cent off TwitPick and the rest is history. Yes. <laughs> All right, so you come out here. It's your full-time job. Uh, are you starting to treat it more like a business at this point? Yeah, so this is kind of the time, too, when people are seeing startups a lot in the news, and like startup stuff, you know. Uh, of course, Facebook is humongous. Zuckerberg is like the poster child of, of uh, young tech. Uh, yeah, start treating it like a real business. We start growing, basically, if you saw our growth graph, it's going this way, here's 2008 and then there's 2009, it's like a hockey stick. Yeah. So that's when our real scaling issues really, really hit. And I actually had to basically, back in Oklahoma, I was buying second or third generation Dell Power Edges, spinning them up in my apartment, and I was putting them in the back of my mom's van and driving them four hours to the data center in Texas. That was the cheapest way to do it. Problem is that by the time I get back home, we were already actually outgrowing that scale. So it's like we had to switch to a provider that would build the hardware for me. It was cloud not a thing then. So Amazon EC2 uh, was so young, you couldn't really host database intensive stuff on it, okay. and uh, it's such so much more. Uh, I hate to say like the young whippersnappers now have it so made, you know, yeah. you know. But yeah. Let me, let me ask you this. So. Okay. How many how many users do you think you have like a year after you moved to Charleston? So we're probably uh, probably in the half a million user range. And yeah. you're a team of three at this point. Yeah, so one okay. we're still one when I moved. We didn't hire our first employee until 15 months later. So this would be the summer of 2009. Oh, I'm sorry, mom and dad were working for us too, but our yeah. first real employee uh, that actually had, we had to pay salary to yeah. <laughs> was 2009. And then we kind of grew there. Our highest headcount was around eight employees. Which is for a site of 40 million users was we yeah. like to say lean. Yeah, so. I mean, hell yeah, but I mean, I'm, I'm talking <laughs> half a million users. Yeah. One technical person is supporting the whole yeah. operation before, like the cloud is like a real thing, right. and you can actually rely on hosted infrastructure. Right. And this is when too, like you know, we're making just enough money. Like I was like, oh sweet, we make, we're gonna make, we're gonna make fifty thousand dollars this year, which is like twice my programming salary back in Oklahoma. I was like I made it, I'm done. Yeah. I'm gonna just ride this out for the next twenty years, be good. And then, um, then the bills started coming in. And this one thing too is like TwitPic was self-funded from the beginning. We were bootstrapped. We never took funding. And I, if you take one thing away from this, my goal would be like, if you're really concerned about funding, you know, it's not necessary. In some cases, yes. But it's not always necessary, and also finding a co-founder is not always necessary. I never had a co-founder, um, and so I encourage you if you have an idea and you want to start building it, and if you have the technical know-how to build it, start building. And and the the more mature your product is, the better your term sheet's going to look if you do go get funding. So yeah, and that that was a deliberate decision. Like you weren't just so yeah like young and didn't need, like. Maybe you didn't know about venture capital. Were you like, you thinking about that? Were you getting calls from VCs? Yeah, we had got started getting calls from VCs very early on. Some were like $75,000 or 25% of the company. 
the earlier line, which is also not very good, and then going up and up and up to the millions or even less than that. And I was like, I didn't want to be tied to someone that I couldn't fully control. Maybe sure. it's because I'm an only child and I don't like playing and sharing <laughs> things with others in that sense, but I uh, just I didn't want it. It's like, we don't need it. I don't want the complexity. Let's not do it. Yeah. So. so what, you're an entrepreneur, you're literally by yourself, you got your parents, but no real employees, or Charleston's probably really young, there's not a lot of other co-founders here. What was like the hardest time period? Like what was the hardest part of doing that for you? Is there a day that sticks out? Yeah, really in 2009, I can't single out one day, it's, like, it's just periods of when you realize the mounting stress. And this also kind of goes into play now too with Twitter. It's so easy now for people to just blast you. And say, screw you, F this, and kind of getting the whole internet bullying stuff. But I was getting some of that, and I didn't really know how to handle that. Like, oh man, they hate me, they hate my product, and they're just blowing off steam because yeah. the site's down, you know? Learning how to not let that get to you, learning how to manage things. There was a period that I let the stress get to me really, really bad. Basically imploding all the time. Uh, I saw the, the news entry, the article about me getting picked up by the cops naked. It's not naked on Daniel Island. It's a mistaken tweet, but anyway, we'll get back to that in a second. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just roll with it. Okay, we're, so we're there. <laughs> I, uh, super stress, uh, just basically, you know, when you get stressed, you just kind of want to just give up and say screw it and you just kind of implode. So I think that's so fed up with the site I was going down, couldn't get rest. I ended up just like tweeting about, about something funny about going streaking. Of course I wasn't going streaking. I think I had my shirt off. Had an open container in my hand. Of course, I'm just feeling good. Going yeah. down Daniel Island, Seven Farms Drive, actually. <laughs> Playing in the sprinklers, all of a sudden, whoop, whoop, here comes Popo. And I was like, I handed him a beer. I was like, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> He's like, why don't you get, just get the back of the car? You know, okay, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Very nice. You know, you got to respect what they do. He didn't handcuff me, and he looked at my phone. So, of course, I twit pick it, getting arrested. Ended up, the cop took me home, uh, dropped me off, shows him ID, pass out. I uh, get woken up with, from mom, of course, with a massive hangover mom, lighting me up. She's like, no, what happened? What are you talking about? And uh, CNN did a story, MSNBC did a story, twit pick founder arrested naked. And so... Uh, they tried calling the news, some of the news outlets tried calling the local PD, but they couldn't get the info, because Everett's my middle name, Wyckoff's yeah. my last name, so couldn't get the info, uh, uh, but basically had a tweet out the next day, listen, I wasn't naked, that was a joke, uh, the officer was very nice, no files charged. What did you, what did you learn from that experience? Uh, don't tweet sarcasm, because it does not be conveyed. <laughs> it does not be conveyed. Yeah. Good. Lesson learned, everyone write that down. Yeah. Uh, okay, so a hockey stick for TwitPick, it's going up and to the right, it's going fast. Are you doing marketing at this time or is it still all organic? Zero marketing. Uh, it just, it grew organically. I didn't know how to do marketing, to be honest. You know, I knew how to program and how to buy a domain and make stuff like that work, but no marketing. Um, no blogs, is that like we marketing like a, or just trying to... Yeah, blogs talk. to show updates, you know, like, hey, we release face tagging and stuff, which is probably a form of marketing, but not like buying ads or anything. What really was our growth was that we basically had every major celebrity on Twitter at the time posting to TwitPic. Uh, one was Ashton Kutcher and Demi Moore, and he was posting photos of them. And I think you got to realize celebrities didn't post things, stuff about them then. You know, they were so used to the paparazzi taking their stuff and just posting it in this tabloid. I think it kind of empowered them to say, this is what I want to put out here. Yeah. This is what you get to see. So that, of course, tapping into their growth of them being so huge helped put the growth. So do you think you were like right place, right time to get Definitely. Definitely. Definitely right place, right time. Um, um, thank God for it kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. Because I could have done it on my own like knowledge. You yeah. know? <laughs> so. Alright, so when did you start building the team? Uh, 2009, 2010, uh, we started hiring. Basically we were just trying to hire engineers. Yeah. Uh, engineering was our biggest bottleneck. Uh, Mom's still doing customer service, bless her heart. And she did a great job and she loved it and uh, forever indebted to them for that. So, um, so you're in Charleston looking for engineers. Yep. What was the technical talent looking like here in Technical talent was very slim in 2009, but I also say that from the standpoint of I didn't get out very much. It's probably more. I realize that Charleston's got a lot of pockets and stuff. Yeah. Uh, since 2009, man, the tech scene here has just grown, blowing up. We've got what, four co-working, five working co-working spots. The heart of these people matter on King Street, their retail offices, and other startups. So, uh, really, not a whole, whole lot. And actually, we had to hire most of our people um, remotely, out of state, uh, because we just couldn't. We would post it here, but we couldn't get any uh, hits on the resumes and stuff. So, how are you finding people out of state? Uh, posting on like tech blogs that had like a drop 37 signals and stuff. So, um, yeah. What was it? So this. I'm 
you were always the CEO, right? But you're the CEO of the three person company, two of them are your parents. <laughs> How did you like being CEO of, you said eight people was, was yeah. max? I never really looked at myself as CEO. I looked at myself, okay, if something breaks, it's my fault. And then, yeah. like, you know, if something hits the fan in the media, it's my fault, <laughs> you know? So I, I just, like, all right, this is the direction we should go. And it was really to grab my tiger by his tail, if you will. Never really felt caught up and uh, just riding this way. And, like, even this is before really any competitors came out, but. We had a, a seven-figure offer come in when I was out in San Francisco, I'd like to buy your company. I was like, oh, appreciate it, thank you so much. And this is kind of when I realized the downside of, of business. Uh, when I turned them down, uh, they launched a competing product. They had copied my API verbatim. I know this because my spelling mistakes were in it. <laughs> that's when I kind of learned, like, oh, so this is how business works. And, yeah. uh, and well, the tech world, but any business world. So. Are you working with lawyers or anything at this point? Or you're just no that was, lawyers. That was doing everything. Yeah. Same competitor tried to uh, trademark TwitPic because I didn't think about trademarking. I thought we were fine. The media ended up calling him out, and that's how I found out about it. And uh, they dropped it, and that's when we started the process of trying to trademark the term TwitPic. So. Okay. So this business, they're in Silicon Valley. They're encroaching on your territory. Do they have a competing product at this point? They're just trying to get the name. Are yeah, competing product, and basically that's when like you know social media is like, well, something. Uh, and I had met with Twitter. Uh, when I was out in San Francisco and did a presentation from their team, and their engineers said, "Yeah, we don't want to do anything with photos. We have no like, suites. So I can own this, you know." Uh, but of course, when you know you see something hot, look at you got Uber and Lyft, Airbnb, Verbo, and stuff like that. So. Yeah. What was it like to turn down a seven-figure offer? Did you consider it? Maybe for a split second, but to be honest, not hard because I knew that I uh, I wanted to see this thing through. You know, whether it flopped or not, I wanted to see it through. What, what was it about wanting to see it through that made you so uh, such strong conviction? <laughs> yeah. We just love what you're doing. Yeah, I love, love the people. You love, well, just love doing it. Love uh, building something with my own hands and knowing that okay, I still control the destiny of this. So yeah. yeah. You didn't want to go back to the other the other <laughs> company you were you were working no for. No writing batch files now. <laughs> All right, so you're getting you're getting a little taste of business, right? It's competitive. People are stealing your shit. You're getting pissed off. <laughs> um, they give you a seven figure offer. Tell them to Go screw yourselves. Yeah. Respect. Right. <laughs> um, so then, then what? What? Give me some more pivotal moments in Swiftpick. So we're still up and to the right at this point. You're fighting yeah. off this other company. So we're basically growing so much. Back in the day, I was happy when we made a thousand dollars a month. You know, uh, we were growing so much that we were operating at about a seventy percent profit rate. Going, going from making, you know, a thousand dollars a month to making nine thousand dollars a day. Off of advertising. Just AdSense? Just AdSense and other ad networks too. Okay. So we were, ba we were making, basically making $7 million a year off of uh, ads. And the funny thing is, like, we kept throwing this money in the bank. We're operating at such a high profit margin that we ended up having literally multiple millions of dollars in the bank and not knowing what to do with it. And that's one thing I kind of hope to see some tax reform on with startups or high growth companies. If you got a bunch of money, maybe not let us pay taxes on it right now because I can't invest that amount of money right now. Maybe let it ride for four or five years. If I have not invested it properly in those four or five years, okay, then penalize me. But you know that's kind of the, the, our, our tax system is a little archaic because we're not a deal that kind of stuff. Sure, so exactly. We invested in some properties and other stuff, but that's basically how to do it instead of paying forty something percent in taxes. So. Yeah, but at that time, like you only got eight people, you got millions of dollars in the bag, bank. Like you made a deliberate decision not to hire twenty engineers. And yeah, we wanted to hire slow, and I think uh, you know. We were so used to operating where, okay, this money we worked hard for, it was not given to us. We wanted to hire slow, and uh, I think that could be, you know, your first five employees set the, the, the culture of the company, you know. They can also make or break your company. Mm -hmm. And you've got a million dollars in funding, you can go out and buy the shiny new office, get the, the Harmon chairs, whatever, and, and, and hire as many people as you want. You know? Where were you guys rocking? Where was your office? What were you doing? Uh, I my apartment on Daniel Island was basically the office, but we all worked remote. You know? okay. And then we moved to a downtown office where I live now. I lived on the second floor, and the office is on the first floor. But everybody wanted to work from home, anyways. You know, so yeah. yeah, just doing your thing. All right, so you're picking up traffic. You're not marketing still. It's 2011 something. Um, I mean, what's going on? Are you just thinking about an exit? Or are you just continually thinking about growing it? Yeah, so towards like 2011, 2012, I think we started thinking, well, you know, if, if it's time to exit, the time would be now. And so we, we actually hired a, a firm to help vet us and stuff and met with X amount of uh, companies and had basically I had a couple stipulations. Um, the main one being was, I'm going to sell you this company, 
but I'm not going to go with it longer than X amount of months. I didn't want to go work for someone else. Sure. The site itself did not need me to run. And so we had finally found someone that was going to offer us over eight or eight figures in the eight, high, eight figure range. And uh, uh, the, but their stipulation was we want Noah to come with it for X amount of years. And I was basically, no, I can't do that. And so we got the phone call, the firm that helped us. The call, listen, just take it. You say you're going to work there for two years, whatever, but she worked there for two weeks. She quit. You get pissed off, you know. Yeah. And I told her, listen, I can't do that. I cannot base the sale of my company on a lie or lose my honor over some change, you know. And so I decided not to sell it for that, that company, just to let it ride on. Yeah. yeah. And that, that was just like a strong moral yeah. decision. Just because I maybe, I don't, just the background I raised, I, I try to view life in, uh, in, in deathbed terms. So when I'm 80 something years old, and I've run my race, and it's time for me to, 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 to pass on. What's going to matter? One, your family around you, who loves you, cares about you. Money ain't going to make me a jack. Yeah. I know I can make money. I can do something. So I'd rather not have that lingering over me for the rest of my life. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Got to respect a man that stands for stands for something as powerful as that. My mom would probably beat me up, too. So. Yeah. Were they, are, are your parents influenced in anything? Like, if you're getting $8 million offers, your dad in the back, like, hey, man, this is... Might be yeah. something you want to do. So my dad, you know, he's an old country boy, you know. Yeah. I am too, now with the Southern influence. But he's like, you know, just, he he worked really hard. He actually ran a lot of the ad stuff too. And so he was, uh, of course, impressed and proud. And I think they just kind of saw like, well, you know, you did it. So, yeah, but, but you're, um, you're trusted to make the right decision. Yeah, right, right. Just keep me out of prison. <laughs> so far, so good, except for the one, the one. Right, right. The back of your car. That's all I need. That's all I need. All right. So you turned down the eight-figure offer. You're feel good about yourself. You made the right decision. Um, so then, what, what what's going on at this point? What's going on with Twitter? What's going on with competitors? You're still yeah. the number one. So Twitter we had, pick. I think, three or four major competitors come out. Uh, they were actually even buying developers and changing, making, paying them to change their photo uploading to their service. Fine, they can do that. The shady part was they were changing the user settings without telling the users. So basically, it's like you going in to Facebook and say so you have things set to private. Yeah. All of a sudden, someone pays to set it to public and not tell you. So pretty messed up. Right. Nowadays, you probably get lawsuits for that. So even through all that, I said, listen, I'm not going to pay one developer to get their service. If I pay one, I got to pay all of them. Okay. Why can I value one more than the other? So didn't do that, but we still maintained and still were growing and still stayed on top. Really, when Twitter launched their own photo sharing options, when we saw a compete. We peaked at growing at about 80,000 users a day and about a million photos a day. That's about our peak. Wow. And so at about 30 to 40 million users, that's when we saw the plateau, and that's when we started seeing the decline. You, Did know? you get a heads up when that's happening? Like, yeah. you know, no. Yeah. You just wake up one day and you're like, Yeah, this. like the news picked it up, and it's funny thing, like Twitter, and I say this, I have no ill will towards Twitter. They're a company, they're huge, and they got to do what's right for Twitter, of course. And they had the big uh, developer conference in San Francisco, the first one. They were like, We're all about communication and being open. I'm like, okay, sweet, you know. Because really, if you think about it, Twitter was built off the back of developers. You know, the Twitter clients that got built, you know, the hashtag and the retweet option weren't even real features until the users brought it up. So uh, the developers kind of felt the knife in the back when, like, okay, you're not giving us any heads up. We do understand you on the platform, but it would have been nice and sure to say, listen, we're going to be moving into your space, yeah. you know. Um, so we didn't get that. Um, so that was the downside of that. But yeah. Twitter's got to do what Twitter's got to do to maintain their growth. Yeah. I understand that. Well, describe what's going through your mind. So you wake up, you see this announcement. Yeah. Like, right. do you think you're going to pivot and find a new way to get traction? Or are you just like, this is a wrap? Like, what are you thinking? I think that's when we try to figure out, let's launch Hilo, a Twitter competitor. If they can do it to us, we can do it to them. You know? So we just whipped together this basically a, a Twitter clone, if you will. Got a million users in two weeks, you know, written up all this stuff. It was more of a like, I don't know, maybe it was kind of immature to do that, but I thought it could be something to take off because Twitter was closing off their ABI, we wanted to be open. Yeah. Um, ended up not sticking, users weren't sticking around because they want to be where their friends are, of course. So other than that, no, we just maintained and um, just kept doing what we wanted to be, the simplest possible way to share photos on Twitter. And then no, like you said, you see it dipping, mm -hmm. Twitter's doing it, you're not, I mean, you're just trying to stay course, you're not trying to right. stay it. course. You're not trying to come up with a new strategy, a new platform to grow off of, you're just trying to maintain. And this is where being self-funded and operating at such a high profit margin came in to our benefit, you know. Uh, companies now say they get such a high valuation, then they got to do a down round, that just jacks up all sorts of shares and stuff. Yeah. So, uh, we didn't have to worry about that. Um, we didn't have to worry about trying to seek funding and stuff, we were okay 
be able to go down and still survive because of operating it that way. You know? Okay. So put the bow tie on it. What 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 transpired with TwitPick? So that? basically, uh, as I said earlier, we had someone try to trademark TwitPick. So we went out. And it took us four years to finally get trademarked where it could be trademark. Our trademark lawyers like, we've never seen this before. You predate the first in use by a year. Uh, we finally got all the roadblocks done with other people that were, could block us. And we had to resubmit their application. So we resubmitted our application. And um, I'm sure Twitter's gone through several law firms that were watching their IP. And we got this email from their legal saying, listen, if you try to trademark this, uh, we're going to shut you off. And uh, which is funny because the term twit pick never even existed until that time. Yeah. It's two words taken together. So and my, my trademark lawyer friend back there, I think we had a conversation last time. Anyways, <laughs> it should have been okay. Uh, basically, I could not not try to trademark it and I could not just give up and roll over. So I said, screw you. Uh, you know, we, we're basically at the point now, maybe it's time to wind down this thing. You know, we don't see the growth growing anymore. Um, so we ended up trying to find a buyer. We actually did find a buyer. Uh, had paperwork signed uh, to do due diligence. Uh, some interesting things happened where I was supposed to come with the company even though I stated I didn't want to or couldn't. And the deal just fell through. Still, it's like I cannot come with the company. It's not my thing. So through a Hail Mary, had a contact at Twitter, uh, which is ironically, I knew her from before she worked at Twitter. From like 2009, had a coffee, and then she became their like, head of business at all. Oh, okay. so, Contacted her and said, hey, listen, we don't want this photo archive to go away. We're not looking for a huge exit here. Set out a certain plan of, of options or stipulations we need to make this happen to give them this site, the trademark, which is what they wanted anyways. And basically closed an acquisition in one week. <laughs> one week was better. And you did it yourself? You didn't have... We had a, a legal team that helped us uh, in Raleigh, that basically did all our stuff, that helped us make sure the, the paperwork was in line and sound. So, yeah. All right. Well, that's a hell of a ride. Yeah. Looking back, are you happy with the way Absolutely. things worked out? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I could not trade that eight years of growing, learning, failing a lot, uh, seeing a lot of shortcomings in myself or anything else. Um, exiting for a lot more money, sure, but I'm fine now and like what would I do with that money versus what I have now kind of thing. And it's more of like it's 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 the chase and the ride and building something that I enjoy. So yeah. yeah. Well, that's certainly the case. So you sell to Twitter. You officially get acquired by Twitter. Did you get to speak to Jack or anyone cool in the process? No, no, we had just... Dick's signature on the paperwork when it came through, which I had met him before when he was not the CEO yet. This is before he exited. Yeah. And uh, that's about it. Uh, it was very very simple, very easy for the most part. There was a couple of, like. This is not what we stated, get this fixed. And of course, yeah. the lawyer did the yelling. I just sit back and be like, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's why you make 300 bucks an hour. <laughs> All right, describe what's that like. Are you sad? Are you excited? Are you relieved to be in this chapter? I actually bawled my eyes out. As soon as I switched on the phone with Twitter, it's kind of embarrassing. All the teams on the phone, I actually gave them, TwitPick, I gave them the login. I started bawling my eyes out. I like mute the phone. I was like, take care of it, you know, <laughs> treat her And, uh, you know, it, it was a part of my life. Yeah. Uh, even still, it's just like that, the, the stuff that I went through wouldn't trade for anything. So. Yeah. Was the team as, as emotional? I mean, they were big. Yeah, so they, uh, the team was great. They stuck through us thick and thin uh, through the, the newspaper article of getting arrested. And stuff. <laughs> so basically, we just gave them a fat severance, and uh, uh, which I was working on a side project, Pingley. I was so burnt out, I was like, I don't know if I want to do this. I can't keep you around not knowing. So here's a fast severance. Go on with your life. Thank you so much. And yeah. um, Respectful. basically took a year off after that. We got bored and then started working on again on people. Did you think right when you wound down Twit Pick that like I'm going back and fight, like this this is what I meant to do or I honestly had to take a long, hard think and think about it, you know, being blasted by the media, you know, one thing I learned too and about the blogs and stuff, usually when they write a story about you, they've already got a pre what they're going to write yeah. about you. Yeah. Yeah. And you're pigeonholed. And we've got like absolute lies written about us and stuff. It's like, it's like, do I want to get back into this? And then after about a week of like solving, like, yeah, heck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So what's the first, what's the first thing you do? Did you have the idea for Pingley in the back of your head for a while? Is it something you thought about and came up with? Yeah. Like, so I had the idea for Pingley about a year before we sold TwitPick. Uh, there's actually not a way. To, I never learned Ruby on Rails. So I want to build an app on Rails. And Pingley with the idea at the time, 
everybody was building email clients to help make email better. And I was like, I'm going to build a better email platform. And uh, set out with that goal in mind, it's now morphed into what it is now. So I give the pitch. What's Pingley? Yeah, so I, so <laughs> I've gone through three iterations of this. So basically, Pingley is um, a unified inbox. It's for email and SMS all in one inbox. But what we're trying to do is uh, everybody was trying to build a better email service. Email is a 30 or 40 year old technology. And you can only do so much on that without building a whole new platform. So what we did is we built a messaging platform that works with email and works over SMS. So that way, if one of your, if, if no one's on there, that the contact ignores, you can still talk to them over email, and it's all seamless back and forth. And our goal is to basically convert how HTML email comes through. It's so messy. We're building message cards that are interactive. And imagine being able to check into your flight from the message card or. Uh, uh, Stuff like that. So yeah. yeah. Why? Well, let me ask this. Do you think you're better positioned to succeed in this company than you were when you first started Twitter? From a knowledge standpoint, yes. From a knowledge standpoint, yes. Um, and then also being able to handle the stress better. You know, I've resolved to myself that completely, completely fall, flop. It's okay. You know, I'll try something else. And uh, and I'm actually getting married. That's Sarah, my fiance. So we're getting married this year. Yes, and that family's the most important thing now. I'm planning that, and that's. That's 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 base. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. So what what do you think, Pingley? What do you what do you want the end? What do you want the outcome of Pingley to be? So and this is the other pitch of Pingley. Pingley is like it's the Pingley's a new direct messaging platform. So I want Pingley to be the way people contact you on the web, whether it be through SMS or email or through Pingley or through voice. And it's all going to be unified into one system. So that's what I want. How are you going to bootstrap? Yep, bootstrapping. I uh, have no plans to take funding, uh, and it's actually just me working on it, and I like it that way. The, 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 some of the most fun times I had with Twitpic one when it was just me, and just working on it, and just you know, creating something you have full control over. Uh, we're, we're outsourcing our iOS app because I don't know how to build those. Um, but other than that, that's, that's, that's it. In three years, would you sell for seven figures? In three years, I sell for seven figures. No, I keep going. <laughs> I don't learn very well. In four, in four years, when you sell for eight figures? Uh, no. Uh, I have a number that I would sell for. I don't want to tell you because you'd probably laugh at me. Uh, no, I wouldn't. You sell for nine figures if you had to work two years. I'm still trying to cover the nine figures. Yeah, no, where, where, where are we then? Yeah, what'd you say now? Yeah, we're at, we're at, a, we're at 100 million. All right, if we're getting up to the 100 mil range, I would think about it, you know? But I'm, I'm actually thinking though, I'm thinking billion dollars. I'm thinking billion, whether it be Pingler or something else, that's where I want to go. But here's why I want to do a billion dollars. I want to build a company that's worth a billion dollars, that's bootstrapped, no oh, yeah. funding, because I don't want to do it the way Silicon Valley does it. Oh yeah, where are you going to build it? Charleston. 100%. 100%. And this is what I want to see in Charleston, if I may. Roll. We've got these great places like Harbor Entrepreneur Center, we've got all this stuff. I want to see uh, incubators pop up. Um, I've talked with some others in here about doing it. Eventually, one day, my goal is to start an incubator in Charleston where we bet the companies like we would a Y Combinator, get them in there. We have a board of people that can help you in every area legal, tech, business, whatever, how to make good espresso, whatever. Uh, <laughs> All and, and give you enough money to work on that idea to get it from here to here if you need it. Just enough so you can quit your day job. Sure. You know? Um, and then try to see us really earn that name, Silicon Harbor. I read some articles, somebody said that in order for us to really earn our name, a big exit has to happen. And I, I kind of agree with that, you know. Um, we're on the map as a tier B tech market, and I would actually like to stay at tier B. I don't want to be in New York, I don't want to be in San Fran, but I want to be a really good B market, you know, because Charleston's a beautiful city. Yeah. A lot of people come in and try to change it, you know how that is with the historic stuff, so yeah, that's the goal. I love and respect the goal, and I'm trying to do the same, so I hope, I hope you see it at the yeah. top. Yeah, I appreciate um, it. <laughs> not in the back of a cop car. That's not in the back of a cop right. car, that's exactly right. We know both our lives took a dramatic turn for the worst if we find each other in the back of a cop car. <laughs> Alright, I'm going to ask two random questions and I'll open it up okay. for Q&A. Um, what's one app on your home screen that isn't well known but you use every day? And don't, uh, don't say... Uh, probably my security camera system in my house. <laughs> okay, is, yeah. that, is that Nest? No, it's, uh, I actually don't really know the name. Uh, I had I had to get it, I, 
had people coming onto my roof at night. <laughs> okay. And I was like, I gotta be able to see this. That, that's part of it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And do you have any like productivity hacks that help you stay focused when yeah. you've got like a million things going on? Yeah. Stop reading blogs. Turn the internet off. Stop reading Medium. Stop reading Twitter. Stop giving yourself that self gratification that I read this life hack and you get that dopamine injection. It's not helping you. Learn what you need to learn, yes, but heads down, stop your networking events, except for startup grind. Thank you. And, <laughs> and, 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 and stay heads down, build a product that scratches your itch, hopefully scratches some other users' itch, and then focus.